You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. A big and important poll running this evening on all our platforms. Who can lick sleepy Joe Biden? A. Trump, B. DeSantis, C. RFK Jr. Really remarkable results and 12,708 of you have voted and I've only just announced the poll. This comes on the heels of a CNN announcement that two-thirds of the American public think that re-electing Sleepy Joe would be either a serious mistake or a disaster. Will the Democrats persist with Poopy is, as their candidate? That is the $64,000 question. Robert F. Kennedy is showing remarkable skill in putting forward a coalition of people of left, right, and center behind the idea of owning your truth, of speaking your truth. We'll talk more about that later. Lindsey Graham, the reptilian, repugnant Republican from South Carolina, was in Kiev again. I don't know what it is that first attracted him to Kiev, but whatever it is, he keeps going back over and over and over again. Maybe he's got a friend there. Who knows? But he seems to be back now because he just demanded a larger navy. Larger in what way? He was not clear. But he says that there is a dangerous gap between Chinese naval power and the missiles to sink navies and the United States capability, showing that once again, the United States is bent on war with China. I've got something to say to Lindsay that he might not have realized, but big hulking floating targets on the sea are OTOs. Building aircraft carriers was the world's worst idea in the age of hypersonic missiles. And hypersonic missiles, China and Russia, for that matter, have in abundance faster than anyone else's, more powerful than anyone else's. So maybe save the US taxpayer a dollar or two, Lindsay, and come up with a better idea than a larger Navy. Unless, of course, you meant something else. Lindsey Graham was in the news because in Kiev, he was videoed sitting at a table with the Ukrainian leadership, minus the head of the armed forces, who's still mysteriously missing in Kiev or somewhere. Lindsey Graham said that the United States had never spent better money than making Russians die. Even by his rodent standards, it was a rat-like comment for an elected U.S. senator to make. And the giggle on his face and the face of those he was promising, no doubt more and more largesse, spoke volumes. But they couldn't have counted on it getting a global audience as it has. And it has made Lindsey Graham something of a target, which he might not in the long run be grateful for. I myself, um, if you'll forgive the phrase, now diving deeply into Lindsey Graham. And I'll be bringing you a more or less weekly update on the charge sheet against him. Some charges already known, other charges I will break for the first time. Now this came on the back, if you'll forgive that pun, of uh, Victoria Newland. You'd have to be, surely, on her back. She said on video to a conference, again filmed by the participants, that she had been working with Zelensky on his counter-offensive for the last three or four months. Three or four months. She, meaning the United States, she is an Under Secretary of State for death after all, has been working with Zelensky for three or four months. This came on the back of a statement delivered deadpan by Secretary Lloyd Austin, 
that the United States was not at war with Russia. Now that would be laughable enough if the Secretary of State had not revealed the U.S. had been working for three or four months on a counteroffensive against Russia. It would be laughable enough if it were not for the case that the terrorists that crossed the border into Russia and gunned down innocent civilian people in their homes, in their gardens, in their cars, were actually driving in United States supplied military armored vehicles. It would be laughable if it were not for the fact that the United States is now about to send F-16s into the war in Ukraine. F-16s is definitely a game changer, but not in the way that its advocates imagine. I believe that Russia has reached the extent of its strategic patience with the never-ending supply of more and more sophisticated weaponry, long-range weaponry, into the hands of the Kiev coup regime. And I believe that Russia has made a strategic decision to end this war and end it quickly. And that will not be pleasant for anybody involved, least of all me, who cried out against this war practically daily from 2014. The move of Russian nuclear weapons, battlefield weapons, we're told, at this stage, so close to Kiev, is a harbinger of very dark clouds to come. It is almost certain, in my view, that it brings the day of a nuclear exchange of weapons over Ukraine very much closer. And Mr. Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, said this day that that's it. The Americans will either come to their senses or hell will be the result. I believe, and I'm not speaking for Russia and nobody in Russia has asked me or told me or advised me to say this, but it is my honest belief on the basis of more than 50 years in Parliament, in politics, almost 30 of those years in the British Parliament, that the Russians have run out of patience and they intend to bring this war to a final conclusion with the defeat of the coup regime in Kiev, a regime change operation, if you will, and the rendering of Ukraine no longer a threat to Russia, which in the end, you know, is what this war was all about. It's what the Minsk II agreements were all about, that were signed by the Ukrainian government and guaranteed by first the German and French governments and then the Security Council of the United Nations. But the Minsk II agreements, as we now know, following a call from President Obama, were merely a ruse to lure the Russians into believing that the problem of Ukraine on its border, killing large numbers of Russian-speaking people in the eastern part of their country, could be resolved by treaty, by international agreement. The terms of Minsk II, because many have forgotten, are worth restating. Because if they had been implemented, a state called Ukraine on its pre-2022 borders would have con continued forever. There would have been, if Minsk had been implemented, autonomy of the kind that the people say of Scotland uh, enjoy, if they enjoy it at all, uh, in the eastern part of Ukraine. What's wrong with that? Ukraine would have retained sovereignty over the territory, but the people would be self-governing governing on an autonomous basis on all the daily aspects of their national and civic lives. That Ukraine would not join NATO 
and that Ukraine would not be used by NATO as a threat against the people of Russia and the Russian Federation, the state itself. Very simple terms. If they had been implemented, we would not be talking about this war now. Just think about that. Robert F. Kennedy is now over 20% in the polls of Democratic Party voters in the United States, making a mockery of the idea that there should not be a primary, there should not be debates. But of course, there cannot be debates. Because Joe Biden, if it is he, and there's a substantial number of people now think he is the result of artificial intelligence gone mad, Joe Biden could not debate anyone, not even a child, even to tell them about how the hairs on his legs stand up, not even a child he could sniff, not even a child whose hair he could stroke. He could not debate against anyone at all, which is why there are to be no debates. But when the incumbent is regarded by two-thirds of the American people as a disaster, the Democratic Party are going to have to think whether they can go into the election in the November of next year and expect to win with a Joe Biden who is visibly fading, wrinkling, shriveling in front of our eyes. Kennedy is young for his age. He's thrusting. He's vibrant, he's dynamic, he's filled with courage, the courage of his father, the courage of his uncle, and he enjoys the resplendence of the Kennedy name. I merely make this point to Senator Robert F. Kennedy's son. If you don't want to end up like Senator Bernie Sanders, you're going to have to put in place a parallel machinery whereby if they cheat you out of the nomination of the Democratic Party, you must be ready to make a third party run for president. And if you do, you stand a very good chance of winning. We're asking in this poll if Ron DeSantis whose campaign went up like a rocket and came down like a burnt stick within a few minutes of the fiasco on Twitter, is the man to lick sleepy Joe Biden. And from what I can see of the poll, hardly anyone at all thinks that DeSantis is the man. Most of you think that Donald Trump is the man, but a significant number of you think that RFK Jr., is that man, 35% on Twitter, 42% on YouTube, 44% on Telegram, and 29% on the YouTube community poll. Get voting. We want a very large and representative result coming out of all of this. Now, we've heard of forced marriages in Pakistan before, but what about forced divorces? One of many extraordinary developments in Pakistan over the last seven days since Major Adil Raja last appeared on the show, where I speculated that the puppet regime in Islamabad would seek to divide the people around Imran Khan the rightful Prime Minister of Pakistan, and in any free and fair election, certainly the winner of any general election held fairly in the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Major Raja told me that it was already happening. And in the seven days since, there has been a steady parade of tearful, fellow leaders of Imran Khan's party, the PTI, announcing that they had resigned from the party and resiling from their previous devotion to Imran Khan. Now, I don't know if they had been tortured 
or had been threatened in a persuasive way, made an offer they couldn't refuse, or whether they were rank opportunistic cowards in the first place. I don't know. Major Adil Raja will know, and he's up in a few minutes. But it must be, although you've not seen it on any of the mainstream media, one of the most miserable parades in modern political history. People who were yesterday leaders of Imran Khan's party giving press conferences outside of courts announcing that they were no longer his buddy. It was laughable on one level, it was miserable on another level, and the only question which now arises is will the people of Pakistan prove more faithful to Imran Khan than his own party leaders? Many of them, anyway, have turned out to be only two minutes to talk about the victory of Erdogan in Turkey. It is a major setback for NATO. Turkey is, of course, a member of NATO. It is a major setback for the European Union. It is a major setback for the United States, whose president openly opined that he hoped for the defeat of Erdogan as president of Turkey. The European media, the Western media in general, has been all guns blazing, trying to bring down the sphinx-like figure of R.T. Erdogan, but they have completely failed. 20 years he's been in power now. He has piloted a somewhat tortuous course between all of the giant lily pads that he has sought to leap from one to another. But over the last year or so, Erdogan has made it plain that he sees Turkey's future as a Eurasian one in alliance with Russia and in alliance with China. And you don't have to love Erdogan, and I don't. But when the worst people in the whole world are praying, are ceaselessly agitating, seeking to subvert the democratic will of the Turkish people just to bring down Erdogan, you've got to say it's good news that he has won convincingly, don't you? Fasten your seatbelts. There's a lot to get through. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. The poll is going great guns. 13,281 of you have voted. Who can lick sleepy Joe Biden? A, Donald Trump, 53% on Twitter. B, Ron DeSantis, 12% on Twitter. C, RFK Jr., 35% on Twitter. On YouTube, it's Trump 52, DeSantis 5, RFK Jr. 42. On Telegram, it's Trump 49, DeSantis 7, RFK Jr. 44. And on the YouTube community poll, it's Trump 63%, DeSantis 8%, RFK Jr. 29%. Get your votes in before the end of the show. Adil Raja retired Pakistani army major, journalist, and whistleblower, joins us again now. Uh, major Raja, thank you for joining us again. We may have to make this uh, a weekly occurrence, uh, given the interest in this subject. Uh, I don't know if you heard my introductory remarks. I was lamenting uh, the parade of unfortunates. Uh, resigning from Imran Khan's leadership and his inner circle, and I suppose implicitly saying what a pathetic sight it was. How did it look to you? Well, George, first of all, thank you for inviting me again 
It will be my pleasure to come on your show and because uh, we need uh, to make things clear to the Western world, to the greater English-speaking audience of what's actually happening in Pakistan right now. I told you last Sunday that uh, this is what is going on, what you're seeing right now. Uh, now, what's happening basically are two things happening at the same time. First, you're seeing a parade of uh, shame, which you're saying. There are certain people who were, who joined Imran Khan on the recommendation of the military establishment, and that is why they are leaving him quite easily. But most of the people who are leaving Imran Khan at this critical juncture are being forced to leave him. They are being blackmailed by either the skeletons in their cabinet or they're being blackmailed by, by you know, the, uh, uh, let, let me give you an example. There was a politician, I know him uh, uh, personally, he left Imran Khan because he was told that they are going to strip his wife naked back at home by the intelligence services. The ISI are going to do that, the internal wing. They are going to do that. that this is the kind of political engineering which has always happened in Pakistan, but this time it is intense because when so our military in Pakistan has carried out a regime change operation. People have been happy about it. People have not objected to it. But this time around, 13 months ago, was the regime change operation was carried out and Imran Khan was deposed of power. The people retaliated like never before in the history of Pakistan, short history, 75 years of Pakistan. Now, now what they're doing is they're forcefully, uh, you know, Breaking away Imran Khan's party, that's what you're seeing. Uh, but I would just give you an example of uh, uh, barrister Malaika uh, Bukhari. She was a minister for Imran Khan. She was uh, near tears when she uh, she was speaking at a press conference. Uh, we call it the hot seat in Pakistan these days, the, pre the pre National Press Club of Islamabad, whosoever sits there and says, I'm leaving Imran Khan. It's, uh, you know, it's almost uh, f funny, uh, I mean, the way they're leaving the uh, uh, the party but she said something very critical she said i've got a 13 year old son now it is my sources tell me that her son had been threatened that they're going to kill the son i can confirm to you uh, i can confirm you i can pledge it i can prove it that the uh, people's mothers have been tortured sisters have been tortured who are supporting Imran Khan they're, they, they, they've been tortured unprecedentedly and this is what this is the level of pressure which is being implied to break away Imran Khan's party now this is happening and parallel what you see happening in Pakistan is that there is a classic conditioning going on classic conditioning is a, psycho a term of psychology now normally the trainers of the animals like the horse whisperers they use this term to train the animals train the, the to to make them believe that they are bounded by chains but in fact they are not bounded by chains now what the military is technically doing the establishment right now is technically doing is that they are carrying out the classic conditioning of the people living in Pakistan through the media and the social media we never believed the social media could be controlled but Social media working inside the Pakistan has been controlled. The primary example is that uh, the ISI's media teams have been successful in mass reporting my content on YouTube and Facebook, which was getting 1.2 million views per day and which was shattering the narrative of the military establishment. They've been able to, they've, they've succeeded in getting my channels terminated on Facebook and YouTube. It's a case study right now. And, well, I am streaming on Twitter and Twitch uh, as a result, but people are not used to these platforms. But uh, this is what is going on. And the remaining people, like Imran Riaz Khan, he's been picked up. He's not to be found anywhere. He was the biggest uh, uh, YouTuber. Uh, uh, he was the biggest social media uh, uh, journalist. And uh, other than him, I was the, I was the one who is telling them uh, because of my sources who are working right now, my colleagues for 21 years working in the military establishment who do not believe in this fascism, who do not, who work for the people of Pakistan, not for the corrupt generals. They are telling me their moves beforehand and I'm still going ahead, exposing them on my Twitter profile. Just go to my Twitter profile at the rate of Soldier Speaks and last 13 months you will see that I've preempted each and every move of their major political moves of there and that's why they're not very happy with me. 
But what they are doing is that they have broken the people's will. They are going into their houses. They are picking up their mothers and sisters. They are ridiculing them. And they are trying to do the classic conditioning of the entire country. The listen, you have to accept the kleptocracy's rule. And the kleptocracy is supported by the military establishment. And why they don't care? Because they don't have to go out to vote. And the future, what they're going to do is that, let me tell you right now, no, market, market right now, George, I'm telling you, they are going to present a budget in this month now. After two days, they'll present a budget and they'll announce that they're going for the election. They're going for the election in October and the election will be completely engineered and they are going to give few seats to Imran Khan's party, right? And they'll say, well, he's lost his popularity. Can you believe that? Well, I do believe it. Of course, I've seen it uh, many times before in my 50 years or so of involvement uh, with uh, Pakistani politics. So I, I do believe it. Uh, so you think that the hint that they were going to ban Imran Khan's party uh, will not happen? They will allow the PTI to participate in the election. Uh, we thought with good reason, that Imran Khan had tens of millions of voters, how are they going to avoid everyone conditioning or not going into the booth and filling in their paper for Imran Khan? How they've been doing it before this, Rod George. Firstly, we need to understand that uh, Mr. Nawaz Sharif sitting here in London is behind all this fiasco in, uh, in Pakistan because he's appointed this army chief and he's got some things on him that he cannot go here or there and he's dictating his terms. He wants a level playing field. Now that level playing field require the Imran Khan's party to be dismantled the way Mr. Nawaz Sharif's party was dismantled by the military establishment. So that is his idea of the level playing field. And the second thing, he is now still impressing upon the military establishment uh, who obviously he's blackmailing or he's got something on the army chief. Definitely that's why they are carrying out the gross human rights violations. They He wants Imran Khan to be uh, disqualified most probably. And they are still going at him. They've got so many options to disqualify him. So if Imran Khan is not in play and if uh, the secondary leadership uh, is uh, you know leading the party, how they're going to do it is a very interesting question, George. How did it? Uh, how did they manage uh, to not let Imran Khan get a two-third majority in 2018 polls? They disabled the result transmission system (RTS). Now imagine that. That is a computer system. They disabled it. It is under the command of the Election Commission. Now this is uh, Election Commission works under the ISI. All right, they are the bosses there. They are like the Gestapo's. They are like the Stasi. It's a Second World War era. Let me tell you, there is no doubt Imran Khan himself has said that the only man who matters is the army chief. So he, they're going to disable the system. Nobody's going to count the votes. Just go for a case study in 2018 elections. Just at the peak of Imran Khan winning, clearly getting a two-third majority, the RTS system went offline. And once it came back online after two, three, few hours, the seats which Imran Khan were winning, they came down. And we were in the military told by the ISI officers that this is going to be the exact number in which Imran Khan is going to get. How did they manage it? They don't let you count the votes. I mean, it took Imran Khan uh, literally for three, four years to get recounting in four constituencies before in, in the previous election before 2018. So they manage things at the face of it. They, man they manipulate things and then they control the judiciary they control the uh, they control the uh, entire system they control the election commission of pakistan through uh, i mean the, the, they've got files on everyone uh, everyone and everything i've told you in in my last uh, in my in my last uh, program with you. The classically, what they're doing is a classic blackmail operation going on. And they've got uh, the, uh, and if, if you've got nothing on somebody, they are going to use uh, uh, you know, they're going to use I don't want to see those words, but that's that's what they do. They're going to use the moral turpitude. Uh, they're going to use, uh, even if they have to use girls, if they have to use boys, whatever they'll use it. They're going to make your videos. They're going to exploit you, blackmail you. They've got to, uh, your, uh, your corruption files ever since you've joined the 
uh, politics or business or from whichever background you come from, they are making files against you. The people who are coming at the top right now, George, the problem is that they are part of the kleptocracy as a whole. And Imran Khan was not able to get rid of these people, not within his own government, not within his own party as well. Well, that is an important point. And I, I, I have known uh, ever since uh, Imran Khan took uh, the wretched Muhammad Sarwar uh, to his breast, uh, that uh, he has surrounded himself with the wrong kind of people uh, from time to time. But let me, in the minutes available to me, turn to a very dark subject, especially in a conservative Islamic society like Pakistan, as puritanical a uh, society as more or less anywhere on earth, and that is the treatment of women prisoners, the treatment of women demonstrators and the women family members of the people that these uh, brutes have targeted. Uh, more and more stories are reaching me one I could disregard, 10, maybe doubt. But I'm now receiving hundreds, and you must be receiving thousands of reports of the mistreatment of women by men uh, in secret, uh, behind bars, uh, in, in dungeons, uh, in barracks. Uh, th this must place a chill in the hearts of the people of Pakistan. George, you are absolutely right. You know, what's happening is unprecedented. I told you the word unprecedented must have uh, come into my uh, conversation last week. Uh, they must have, it must have been the predominant word, uh, unprecedented. What's sort of happening is unprecedented. That's why I'm telling you again and again, that's unprecedented. The, the, the kind of uh, supporters, women supporters Imran Khan has got, and they're in the jail, they're unprecedented. How? They belong to middle class families, upper middle class, well-educated families. They, even right now, Khatija Shah, she is the, the granddaughter of the ex-army chief, General Asif Nawaz Janjua, and she's a, she's a, fa a fashion icon in Pakistan. Imagine she's in jail right now, and she's being treated under anti-terrorism laws. There are young girls who, who've got, who never knew what Pakistani politics was like, who comes from very comfortable environments in their homes. They've been put into a small little cell where there are no basic human needs as such you know it's not as a, it's not a jail of uh, the uk or usa it's a pakistani jail you might have seen in the mexican movies maybe it's it's the worst kind of jails in, out there and they're being maltreated they're being there the, 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 there are reports of alleged rapes and that's why the interior minister of pakistan came late last night and given them uh, get a press he has to give a presser that you know they are going to come at us with these allegations we've got nothing to do it there it's so they're only doing it for political point scoring but they're scared because they've done all these things to break Imran Khan's political uh, uh, alliances to break Imran, Imran Khan's worker. They've done the worst kind of the things and they're going to come out right now. But let me add, George, how is it possible that the Pakistani military is doing it? And uh, even then the British Prime Minister comes out and says that it's their internal matter or the American deep state, uh, if they're not supporting them, then how is it possible that they're able to do what they're doing right now quite so openly? I mean, they, there is definitely a blanket control over the mainstream media. The last TV channel standing was Bold TV and they've made a deal today like the ARY and they're going on air. They're back on air. Just look at the reporting. They'll be reporting everything which is being told to them by the ISI and ISPR. Now they are controlling the social media they're trying to control. They are trying to control the, the, the whistleblowers like me abroad. They're trying to... I mean, you take me to a court of law, George, all right, and I will give a witness a statement with proofs that they are coming after the woman and they are doing the worst kind of acts with the woman which are unprecedented. Has it worked? Uh, have Is Imran Khan finished? George, Imran Khan's an idea. 
he cannot be finished. You cannot kill an idea. You can, you might will be able to get rid of Imran Khan, but you won't be able to kill the idea which Imran Khan has given. The set, the mindset, the narrative built over 75 years in Pakistan have been shattered away with. They said that the Bangladeshis uh, who broke away were themselves. Uh, it was the, it was because of the politicians and because of Bengalis themselves they went away. Now people say Sheikh Mujibur Rahman is a hero. He went away because of the Pakistani military was doing the thing which they are doing right now we you, we were made to believe that the balochis they are doing it only because they are support being supported by the indians now people say that we've been we were being lied to by the military no the balochis are being persecuted they are being raped the women are being raped they are being killed extra judicially judiciously take me to a court of law george i'll give you the proof i'll give you the witness statement all right this is what they are doing people believe that the tribals were you know right now even the army chief talks to his Officers and they says, well, these he talks with disgust about the tribals who've got their tradition. Pakhtun Wali, you asked me last time that uh, are the army going to revolt or resist? No, the people in Khyber Pakhtun Khwa is going to revolt and resist because it's as part of their tradition they carry arms and ammunition with them. And they, you know, only only province in which they want, they're not able to touch the woman are is the Khyber, is the province of Khyber Pakhtun Khwa because these people they went to their mosque and in the loudspeakers they let the entire area know that if the military or the police or any other law enforcement agencies try to enter your home just shoot at them this is what they're saying and that's why they haven't gone in there but people in punjab where they their so called developed uh, developed province so called uh, uh, i mean the, 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 their well to do province but uh, they, they don't they don't carry arms and ammunition with them so they are just accepting it just like the way and that's why it's so easy 80% of people in pakistan live in punjab so that's why they're able to do this carry out this classic conditioning operation major raja Thanks for joining us with this very dramatic and still growing, it's not finished, this story of the overthrow of democracy and the declaration of uh, martial law without the declaration. The army and the ISI are now running Pakistan. I'll be right back. 60 seconds. Count them. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Mike Jones, IL Grey TV, caused me a sleepless night this week. I'm sure he caused his mother one too. The news came through on, in the wake of what happened to our regular guest, Gonzalo Lira, when I heard the news when it came through. Uh, that uh, Mike Jones was missing uh, in the Donbass, near the front line, I frankly feared the worst. But eventually, he was found, he's back, and he's here on the show. Mike Jones, by the grace of God, welcome back to the mother of all talk shows. Would you like to tell the audience first what happened to you and to your, uh, your colleague, Marsha? Thank you, Mr. Galloway, once again for having me on. Yes, uh, I will be uh, as uh, brief as I can. Uh, yeah, we're both we're both safe. We always were. Whilst we were kind of at risk, we were in good company. Um, unfortunately, YouTube uh, didn't enable me to inform my audience myself, thanks to a back-to-back -back ban where they banned me twice in a row, uh, which unfortunately led to some uh, upset and, as you say, some unnecessary worry from people um, for an undue length of time. Um, did you just get lost or uh, were communications cut off? There was no internet? What happened? Somewhat careful with what I say. Uh, so a day trip to Solidar and the front lines there to see the situation, um, things got a little bit hot. So we found ourselves unintentionally embedded with a frontline infantry unit of soldiers south of Bakhmut. And of course, due to Ukrainian tactics, whereby they track foreign uh, SIM cards, you have to not only put your telephone on airplane mode, but also disable location GPS tracking on it. So I had to go completely black and completely dark. Uh, this was unintended. Unfortunately, we were supposed to be back, obviously, at our hotel that evening. 
Uh, but due to the situation, which I'm told resulted in even the general of the unit having to be evacuated rather quickly, we of course fell down the uh, down the level of priority. And uh, I've been in the army, and I understand what it's like. So a transport that was supposed to come for us was of course diverted elsewhere. So we spent the night in a basement, uh, which was surprisingly comfortable uh, south of Bakhmut, um, with some amazing guys, uh, really incredible. Um, a range of guys young and old and i i was quite quickly accepted into them despite my nationality and some sort of standoffish looks to begin with i was told my russian is spoken without an accent <laughs> which also didn't help <laughs> perhaps for a while with some mi6 jokes but when i told them my story and my motivations they uh, very quickly understood and they were they told me that it was a huge morale booster to hear the level of support from the West and also that people like myself are doing what I'm doing and aren't afraid to go to the front lines to see for themselves what's going on. So that was a particularly uh, valuable and moving experience. Let's turn to the war uh, in general then. Uh, any sign of that Ukrainian counteroffensive? Uh, you you may say in, in some words there was some increase in activity on uh, certain front lines. Uh, but from what I asked of it, um, no, there doesn't appear to be this much lauded counteroffensive that we've been promised. The military expert Andrei uh, Marochko told me that uh, it's an information counteroffensive. It's a propaganda counteroffensive at this point in time. Whether it transpires that it forms into an actual physical offensive, we shall see. But uh, I'm leaning towards agreeing with him. But we there was some fairly intense shelling when I got back to Don uh, Donetsk. Uh, there was an attack on a civil administration building the day I arrived. Six HIMARS were fired at this building, timed, uh, incidentally, to uh, with a pause between the initial strike to hit the journalists and emergency services later. Uh, it was posted on the subreddit r slash Ukraine, where they celebrated the fact that propagandists were hit by HIMARS uh, on this civilian administration center in Donetsk later on. So that's what I'm seeing of the counteroffensive in the Donbass region so far. Although they did send terrorists inside Russia in American military vehicles, uh... Can you tell us any more than most people already know about that, namely that they're all dead? Uh, but how did they get in and how much damage did they do? Uh, from the last I read, one civilian, um, I believe he was a clerk uh, of the border guard, was shot in the back of the head by these saboteurs, as they're called. Uh, approximately 80 of them infiltrated into the Belgorod region. And uh, initially, Ukraine tried to distance itself and said that this was the Russian Freedom Legion, or they tried to put it on some internal group. However, the fact that uh, American equipment was very visible and quite clearly used, MRAP vehicles, for instance, uh, then put pay to that theory that this was an internal struggle or, or uprising of some nature. So this was very definitely something masterminded by Kiev. Remember that this occurred very shortly after the fall of Bakhmut, which must have been an incredible um, blow to morale in Ukraine. So it, it served its purpose at the cost of 80 human lives. Media attention was drawn away from this crushing blow to Ukraine. And that, again, said a lot uh, about the Kiev regime and served again once more as we've seen with many of these sort of propaganda efforts has only served to solidify russian resolve they're always trying this uh, false flag story aren't they they did it over this uh, column that entered russia they did it over the drone attack on the kremlin which the united states now accepts was a ukrainian operation they did it over the nord stream where they tried to blame Russia for blowing up its own gas pipelines. And now the German government has said that the arrow points at Ukraine as having been the perpetrator of that. Uh, and they've done it, of course, in, in various uh, military situations, the maternity hospital in Mariupol, I think it was, in the yep. massacre that they themselves carried out uh, in Bukha. Uh, this is standard operating practice for them, isn't it? 
Yeah, it's it's become almost farcical at certain points. We've we've seen this strike in Dnipro that was supposedly blamed on Russia, then very quickly turned out to be an S-300 missile by all accounts from the studies of the explosions. Then CNN reports that Ukraine's AA defense is working better than ever. Uh, and yet somehow Russia still was responsible for striking this outpatient clinic when quite clearly the evidence seems to point to the fact that it was a Ukrainian anti-air missile that went astray and once again hit a, a civilian area. And we saw it in Kiev as well with these anti-aircraft missiles going off uh, and hitting residential buildings. Very quickly, the BBC picked up on that and blamed Russia for it. Again, when you hear the news, and I often get sent letters and emails asking me, you know, is is this the case? Uh, when I start to dig deeper into the details, a very common theme occurs with many of these uh, propaganda spins and false flags and uh, atrocities that uh, are leveled at Russia. Now, I'm not saying Russia is blameless by any means, and I'm I'm certainly not saying that mistakes aren't made and that you know missiles don't go astray. Uh, but just nine times out of ten, you can normally, uh, with your critical thinking, uh, cut through all that rubbish and and start to understand the common theme that occurs. Well, I'm old enough to remember when uh, one of the missiles landed in Poland and uh, mm -hmm. Zelensky himself told us that it was a Russian attack on Poland until it wasn't. And the Americans themselves announced that it was a Ukrainian anti-aircraft uh, missile. What about the raids on uh, Kiev? There's been a stepping up of Russian bombardment in Kiev. What are they hitting there? Uh, from what I understand, and do forgive me, I have been out of the loop for the past 10 days somewhat, uh, given <laughs> uh, being near the front lines. But uh, for the most part, as I understand, these are uh, critical infrastructure, generally energy related, to prevent the supply of these Western weapons. We had that uh, radiation fiasco after the British ammunition was seemingly detonated in the west of Ukraine, causing a lot of embarrassment. From what I'm told, uh, the monitoring website has seemingly gone down or inactive, uh, where it appears, and I don't know this for a fact, uh, do correct me in the comments on YouTube if I'm incorrect here, but it seems they are not wishing to publish the uh, gamma radiation levels that have seemingly increased in that area. So uh, this appears to be the aim. So targeting the stockpiling of these weapons uh, and neutralizing them before they can be utilized on the front line. And this is also applied uh, off the record uh, to leopard tanks uh, as well that have been destroyed. Um, but uh, we shall see some uh, evidence of that shortly, I hope. Uh, now, the F-16s are on their way, or are they? Who's going to fly them? Uh, Ukrainian pilots uh, clearly cannot pl fly them. Are they going to put mercenaries in the cockpit, do you think? I have no doubt, absolutely. These will be volunteers. Um, to quote Squat Ritter, sheep dipped as Ukrainian pilots. Uh, the last I heard, the Netherlands were offering their F-16s to start with. Uh, I, I, I don't envy the guys that have to sit in the cockpits of these things. I do believe that the integrated air defense systems of the Russian Federation will wipe them out. Uh, Russia has air superiority over Ukraine. And these these aircraft uh, won't be a match for certainly not the S-400 systems. So I expect that there will be a combination of uh, use of the Storm Shadow long-range missiles with the F-16s. Uh, I believe they will be further used, as I showed uh, on Telegram, where I published a video where I visited the Lugansk um, Center for Joint Communication and Coordination of these strikes, where I showed the proof of Storm Shadow missiles being used against civil and civilian uh, areas in Lugansk, which is an area that previously hadn't been able to be reached by Ukraine. But I, I expect that F-16s will be employed to to fire off these, um, these Storm Shadow missiles and other long-range munitions, given the dwindling supply of the Soviet aircraft that Ukraine has left at this point in time. Why has Russia moved nuclear weapons into Belarus? I expect that this is uh, a little bit of a, a chess game where there's a, the queen has been moved into one position and now NATO has to reconfigure and uh, really understand that if they want to keep playing this game, if they don't want to start negotiations, then they, they really have to... Uh, it sounds hollow at this point, 
you know, with this escalation that's kept going on and on and on, uh, especially when it comes to NATO, they've done some things that have really left me quite baffled. Uh, I think this is Lukashenko has welcomed uh, this move as well, which again uh, one has to consider, given that you know if Belarus is therefore a target, the population is at risk. But he must be sufficiently assured that uh, the presence of these weapons in his country is a sufficient deterrent to NATO. Uh, and I'm including Finland there as well, newly admitted members, to actually just reconsider their behavior and their involvement and whether they really do want to continue going the way they're going or whether they can actually consider an off-ramp at this point. Well, Mr. Lavrov said today uh, that the Americans have to uh, come to their senses uh, or hell will be the result. What do you think he meant by that? I, I think it's pretty literal. Uh, I... I think the way that the West is continuing to antagonize, um, and it's, it's not just even with nuclear, it's with chemical and biological weapons as well, specifically chemical. They're employing them with extensive use along the front lines, along certainly Donetsk, where I saw evidence of their use. Uh, they continue to use every other tactic employed to try and antagonize. And I, I think Russia is really doing its best um, as we've seen, they, they don't react, they don't employ knee-jerk reactions, but they are very clear and uh, very precise in both their wording and their actions. Uh, and I hope that perhaps this message is heard and read by the West, but that hope is quite thin at this point. Indeed thin, as it should be, because uh, this uh, trusting in the endless patience of Russia uh, must uh, be increasingly being tested. And my reading of Mr. Lavrov's remarks today were a little darker than yours. Uh, I thought it was the most hawkish thing that he has said. I wonder if Russia's strategic patience is not very close to running out. Well, Shoigu himself had said that uh, there are only so many steps and we're rapidly running out of them. Uh, I would agree with you. Actually, Lavrov is generally very measured, uh, very calm. Uh, he's the commensurate diplomat and statesman, probably one of the finest we've seen of our time uh, at this point. But yeah, I, I think that is a good reading of his words. And I, I think that's intended as well, uh, that uh, this can only go on so long. And yes, uh, these parties that are Lindsey Graham springs to mind today uh, as well. His words, he's been one of the worst that I've, I've come across these. I, I'll watch my words. These individuals uh, need to really reconsider and rethink their strategies and perhaps eat some humble pie and just admit that they haven't achieved their stated aims and goals in destroying the Russian Federation. Well, Lindsay loves a sailor, and you're looking rather like a matelot at the moment. So take care, Mike. He might actually uh, take a liking to you. Mike Jones, our man who was on the front line, is now back safe and sound and regularly uh, broadcasting on the mother of all talk shows. Thank you, Mike, for joining us. I'll be back right after this break with a deep dive into the Turkish elections. Stay tuned. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. My uh, next guest is, as I said, one of the most impressive analysts and writers that I have come across for a long time. S.L. Kantan is a geopolitical analyst, writer, and independent journalist. And we're lucky he joins us now on the mother of all talk shows. Uh, Mr. Kantan, thank you for joining us. Uh, we want to talk principally uh, about Turkey. The CIA have lost the Turkish elections. Is that a reasonable summary? Absolutely. You know, uh, the biggest loser in this election was not the opponent, Mr. Uh, uh, Kilish Derolu, but uh, the U.S. and uh, the CIA. And as you uh, pointed out, uh, uh, the U.S. has been uh, trying to uh, uh, derail uh, the, uh, the Aragon's uh, candidacy for a long time. 
And uh, back in uh, 2016, uh, the CAA tried to stage a coup. And what happened was actually, I mean, or at least uh, the urban legend is uh, Russia's Putin made a uh, phone call uh, to Erdogan and uh, he warned him about uh, the coup. So for the last uh, seven years, uh, uh, the U.S. has been bullying Turkey with all kinds of sanctions and threats and uh, trying to force uh, Turkey's uh, foreign policy. And then they made a really big uh, faux pas uh, 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 so during this election where they uh, brazenly uh, tried uh, to manipulate uh, the election. Uh, the, you know, if you looked at all the uh, Western uh, media, uh, they all constantly uh, attacked uh, uh, Erdogan and they totally uh, uh, glorified uh, the opponent, Mr. Uh, Kilish Durolu. And you had uh, the CAA front organizations like uh, the National Endowment of Democracy. They uh, uh, met with uh, the opponent and they had a lot of uh, social media campaign for him. And uh, more importantly, uh, the U.S. Uh, started like an economic warfare against Turkey for the last two years. So basically, uh, Wall Street, it started uh, to attack uh, the lira, uh, Turkey's uh, currency. And it lost over 50 percent in the uh, last two years. And that caused very high uh, 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 inflation and a tremendous suffering for uh, the Turkish people. But they uh, stood by uh, Erdogan because they wanted uh, stability. And I think they kind of understood uh, the bigger picture as to what's happening. And the most uh, shocking thing is that uh, one of uh, the ministers, uh, Soylu, uh, he's like uh, uh, Turkey's, uh, the interior minister, and uh, he said something really uh, shocking. He said, uh, well, if somebody is going to propose a pro-U.S. foreign policy, that person would be considered a traitor. So I think that uh, we're going to see a tectonic shift in uh, Turkey's uh, foreign policy in uh, the next uh, five years. You can see then why uh, the CIA and its uh, front organizations uh, are nervous. The stakes are high, after all. Uh, the uh, NATO is, uh, Turkey is a member of NATO. Uh, it is a candidate member of the European Union, though it will be a candidate forever and uh, never, uh, never be allowed in, of course. Yeah. But there are millions of Turkish people most of whom support Erdogan, by the way. The votes of the diaspora are being counted now, and Erdogan has won even bigger amongst them uh, than, than inside Turkey itself. Uh, so uh, Turkey is a problem uh, for them, but not only for them, sir. Uh, there will be not much rejoicing, for example, amongst the Syrian people uh, tonight, uh, Erdogan's great uh, victory. Uh, because Erdogan played a very, very bad role in the Syrian conflict for a long time, openly in alliance with the alphabet soup of Islamist extremism that became this terrorist monster uh, in Syria. So this tectonic shift that you describe, will that also imply a different role for Turkey in Syria? Absolutely. I think that uh, so you will see that uh, within the next uh, month or two, I think uh, uh, Turkey will seek rapprochement with uh, Syria. And we've seen that with uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, the UAE. Uh, they all supported uh, the jihadists 
uh, but during uh, the proxy war, you know, uh, that started in uh, 2011. But I think uh, they all have now realized that uh, there's no point in this, um, uh, the perpetual wars and uh, being a uh, victim of uh, the U.S., uh, the divide and rule. So uh, we've seen how China and Russia are bringing all these parties together, right? Uh, so uh, China brokered the deal between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, which would have been completely unthinkable like uh, one year ago. And uh, Russia is uh, bringing uh, uh, Turkey and Syria together. And so I think uh, the future is going to be, uh, f- you know, uh, focus on uh, the infrastructure, peace, trade, and uh, the development. Uh, because uh, but Turkey is not going to gain anything by uh, being allied with uh, the U.S., which has no uh, uh, positive uh, 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 plans, you know. And you talk to uh, with China. Uh, then uh, uh, China will say, uh, well, hey, Turkey, uh, we can bring a lot of uh, manufacturing uh, plants into your country and you can be a uh, uh, part of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and we'll have uh, the trains coming all the way from uh, uh, China to uh, Turkey and uh, beyond. And, uh, and they have plenty of uh, futuristic ideas, right? And uh, for Russia, it can uh, uh, bring in more pipelines into Turkey. So uh, that is uh, the constructive and uh, the positive plans. And if uh, Turkey is able to join uh, BRICS, and if uh, BRICS has its own, I mean, uh, the currency, that will solve Turkey's economic problems because. Right now, uh, Turkey is uh, caught in uh, the debt trap of uh, the U.S. dollars, right? And uh, that's why uh, uh, the central bankers of uh, Turkey, uh, who I think should all be fired, they wasted like uh, with $250 billion over the last three years trying uh, to prop up uh, the currency, right? Uh, so, uh, but Turkey will not have such problems if it has uh, the alliance with uh, uh, the East, uh, the BRICS world. Because I know you're a Renaissance man, I don't hesitate to make a slight turn in the conversation. We all wondered why Joe Biden left $88 billion worth of military hardware in Afghanistan in the hands of the Taliban that America and Britain and others had spent 20 years fighting. Is the answer playing out on the border with Iran right now? Because that American military hardware is being used to kill Iranian border guards and the uh, section of the Taliban has announced they're going to conquer Tehran. That would suit Joe Biden and co. quite well, wouldn't it? Absolutely. You really hit the nail on the head. Um, Because, you know, uh, the U.S. is uh, the empire of uh, chaos, right? And uh, all they want to do is uh, disrupt. So they want uh, to disrupt uh, China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And they want uh, to disrupt uh, the trade between China and uh, the Middle East. So, uh, like you said, uh, uh, this would be uh, the perfect opportunity for uh, the U.S. to uh, stir up some uh, trouble. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, then as we see, uh, I mean, I saw uh, the coup in uh, Pakistan. So now we might be able uh, uh, to connect the dots, right? So uh, the military weapons like in Afghanistan and uh, the coup in Pakistan may all be related. So 
uh, the only hope is that uh, so uh, with China and uh, Russia, they seem to have a little bit more leverage with uh, the Taliban. So uh, that's the hope that they might be able uh, to intervene and uh, uh, to calm down uh, the temperature. Uh, but if not, it would be very bad news for uh, that whole region. You know, uh, just about uh, but about ten days ago, um, uh, but China had this uh, uh, the Central Asia summit. You know, and they brought in all these uh, five stan countries like. Uh, uh, but Kazakhstan, uh, but Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and all of them. So, and uh, that was uh, the uh, the grand plan for uh, the future, uh, the integration. And now uh, the wild card uh, could be uh, the Taliban, who could start uh, to create more problems uh, for everyone. So we would have to wait and see. Well, we... Yeah, we do live in the age of monsters, but a monster, a a, a multi-headed monster of Joe Biden, the Taliban, and uh, maybe one other uh, would be the most uh, ugly monster of them all. It's been a privilege finally meeting you, albeit on screen. S.L. Kantan, thank you for joining us on The Mother. Thank you so much, Mr. Galloway. It's, It's been my honor. Welcome. Uh, It's now official. Uh, Turkish President Erdogan has won the Turkish election and has been returned for a third term as president. And he has been congratulated by President Putin and President Macron, one of whom meant it and the other of whom didn't. Another legend on the line, Norma in Bristol. Norma, what would you like to say? Hello, George. Um, well, in actual fact, this, I like the tennis, as you know, and it's such a pleasant mm. diversion from all the troubles. Now, today at the French Open, which is a big one in Paris, um, the Ukrainian tennis player was booed by the spectators because she refused to shake hands with the Belarusian player, who, in actual fact, is second in the world. Alice Sabalinka. Now, these individual players, they don't compete as in, they don't play for their countries. They just play as individuals. And, um, you know, I find it quite upsetting, really. Except that the Belarusian beat the Ukrainian, if oh, yeah, I well, she's have good. followed she's the good. tennis correctly. Yeah, yeah, so the last did. laugh yeah. was on her. And the public in France uh, is well in advance of the public elsewhere in Europe, although it's a rising tide of people that are tired of this Ukrainian uh, play. Uh, the French people backed the Belarusian, and the Belarusian beat the Ukrainian. And therefore, the last laugh is with her, I think. Uh, I'm not, yeah. uh, I don't have time to go further. Go ahead, Norma, last point from you. Well, no, I mean, she was expected to win. She's a very good player, Sabalenka, the Belarusian. But, I mean, if just very quickly, say it was a football team representing their country in an international competition um, where there were atrocities and things then that would need to be reviewed. But these individual tennis players are just playing and I want to enjoy it and I don't want to see these things going on, you know. Yeah. Mm. Norma, they are banning dead Russians' music from being played on radio stations, banning uh, their orchestras from playing the classical music that has resounded through the ages because it was written by a dead Russian who died in the 19th century, long before Lenin, long before Stalin, long before Putin, but his music is banned in many Western countries, including in our own, including, if I'm not wrong, in uh, your own city of Bristol was one of the culprits in that. 
Look, we are living in the middle of a psyops. It's not working, the psyops, but that doesn't stop them playing it. The tweet of the week for me was when Elon Musk tweeted this. Take a look at it. This. Nika Headley. And I'm Ryan Wolf. Our, our greatest, greatest responsibility, responsibility is, is to, to serve, serve our, our Treasure Valley communities. The El Paso Las Cruces communities. Eastern Iowa communities. Mid-Michigan communities. We are extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that CBS4 News produces. But we are concerned about several trending and irresponsible one sided news stories plaguing our country. Plaguing our country. The sharing of biased and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish these same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of biased and false news. <laughs> the sharing of false stories without checking the facts first. We are living in a sea of mendacity. The mendacious sea is the one that we are afloat upon. And it is because the mind controllers are running out of arguments, running out of adherence, running out of people who will believe them that they are banning the likes of... Uh, the people that have had their YouTube channels blocked here that have been on this show this evening. I, I didn't know that Mike Jones had been banned on YouTube. I didn't know that Laurie Spencer uh, had been banned on YouTube. I didn't know that all these people, because YouTube doesn't ban me uh, and has in fact allowed a huge number of people getting on for uh, 275,000 people to subscribe to my channel and kept up my videos with views, in one case, of more than 100 million views. So, uh, forgive me, because I'm focused on building moats and hopefully building it in different languages and in different places, I don't often come across on YouTube the kind of blocking and strangulation and outright banning that other people speaking their truths uh, are uh, having to endure. But I did for a very long time, more than one year, on Twitter, which is why I have a legal action against Twitter in the uh, courts in Dublin, which is the place that Twitter is officially registered as belonging to. And that case will continue. I insist on justice. Now, the cause of the legal action has been removed. The banning and blocking and strangulating has eased quite considerably. I now have um, uh, 470 thousand followers on Twitter. This show is, as I said to you at the beginning, being watched by millions. But I will not walk by on the other side of the road and stay silent when others who have been unjustly banned and blocked are being done so. And my heart goes out to my good friend, Randy Credico, this evening. And I'll do everything I can to get him back on uh, Twitter. But my main point is you can't win with a losing hand as Bob Dylan, 82 years young, forever young, said in his wonderful song, Things Have Changed. You can't win with a losing hand. The West is playing a losing hand and it cannot win. It can forestall the uh, inevitable. It can delay it but it cannot win with a losing hand. Our economies are defunct, kaput. Germany is now officially in recession. In fact, it has been in recession since September of last year. You can't win with a losing hand. Our economies uh, were fundamentally weak, but are now drowning as a result of the 
actions, self-harming actions, including the blowing up of a European pipeline by the United States of America, at least on the orders of the United States of America. We are sinking into a sea of our own making. We are presiding over a jungle. Europe has become a jungle of lawlessness, of, of vice of all kinds, of maniacal ideas that uh, were last seen in, the, in, in, in Pompeii before, the, before the, 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 the deluge, that were uh, fundamentally weakening uh, the sinews of our society. Everything that was precious to us is now profaned. Everything that was solid to us has now melted into air. We have a losing hand. China and Russia, Turkey, Iran, Brazil, Africa, Latin America, they are the ones that have the winning hand. Instead of trying to befriend them, we have declared them to be enemies that must be, if not invaded and occupied, then destabilized and manipulated and weakened by regime change operations, by Trojan horses full of NGOs that are parked in these countries. In the Middle East, we have lost people. Uh, Peter Ford, His Excellency, the former British ambassador, wrote recently, who lost Saudi Arabia? What a disaster for British and American diplomacy, that a country they created for a precise purpose has now been lost to them. A royal family, armed and ass-kissed for decades by us, has now turned against them. It's now about to join the BRICS bank, putting its phenomenal wealth behind the bank of the BRICS. The queue to join the BRICS could scarcely be longer there's not enough letters in the alphabet to describe the BRICS as it will be in five or ten years from now. Bob was right. You can't win with a losing hand. You can bluff. You can try and kick the table over. But you can't win with a losing hand. Me, I'm observing it all. I'm doing my bit as the leader of the Workers' Party of Britain to try and save our people, at least, from the perdition which awaits us all if we don't force our governments to change or indeed change our governments. I'll be back, God willing, on Wednesday at the slightly later time of 9 p.m. UK. I hope you'll join me and I hope that you will bring another viewer with you. And if you do, think about it. 1.38 million watched in the last seven days. If each of you brought one viewer, we'd have an audience that would cause them to cry in Langley, Virginia. Just think about that. It's been marvelous.